Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the Platform Book Club. We have another um, another author here with us today. We've got another book that we're going to be discussing. Um, so I want to say a huge hello and welcome to it's Corey Anderson, the author of What Beauty There Is, which is a book that we have been reading all throughout this month together. Um, and so we are going to be talking about the book, about um, uh, the writing process, all of that good stuff. Um, so hello, welcome. Hi, how are you, Rowan? I am doing so fantastically well. For I think this is um, the first time that it has still been sunny vaguely outside for one of these at the UK time and will actually not be dark by the time we finish, which is very exciting for me. Normally I'm doing this in the dark um, and all the Americans are doing it way too early depending on the coast that they're on. So this is always fun. Um, cool, so for everyone who is watching at home um, and you're like, what is the book club? If you've never heard of it before, maybe you're dropping in because you're interested to hear more about um, the book, but don't know about the book club. Basically every month we read a new YA book together and um, the link uh, to the discord is in the description that's how we chat and then we have the live uh, live stream with the author and you can ask them any questions you want so in the chat I'm going to be looking at the chat um you can uh put any questions that you want to put to Corey and I will ask them which is very exciting um so uh the only other thing to say is that if you haven't finished the book yet um this first section of the video uh you can still watch because we're not going to be doing um kind of spoilery questions until the second half of the video where you can ask any questions about the ending and all that good stuff um, and I will give you a warning as to when we are starting the spoiler section so that no one's going to get spoiled. Um, sweet, cool. So um, let's go with the first question which is always kind of I feel like the same um, for all of them but it's always so interesting to hear everyone's answers and this question actually got asked this week um, this month by Taylor at the discord which was what was your inspiration for the book? Oh, that is always one that gets asked and I'm, I am answering it differently just every single time it gets asked. So <laughs> I think that there are a lot of different inspirations for books and that that can change while you're even writing it. But initially, I guess there were probably two answers. One is I have always loved crime noir. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up as a kid, I watched crime noir um, with my dad. And even, you know, as I became a teenager and a young adult, I just fell in love with those kind of suspense, mystery, procedural kind of, um, mostly it started as movies and then became books. But I just would eat those kind of stories up like Fargo or No Country for Old Men, Later Winter's Bone. Uh, things like that were definitely inspiration for the book. Um, and then on a more personal note, I think that I definitely drew from my own life experiences to try to give the book something that felt really honest from me. So I would say that those are the two, those are the two big answers. Like I just adore crime noir. And then Jack and Deva are both um, very much parts of me. So it drew from my own emotions and experiences to try to create them in a way that made them feel honest and whole as characters. Amazing. We're going to talk a little bit more about characters and stuff later on, but I kind of wanted to talk about, I guess, the writing process in this first section. Um, are you like a plan planner sort of writer? Like, are you always wanting to make sure that you know exactly what's going to happen in the whole story before you start writing? Or were you just like, I'm going to see where these characters take me? Oh, I am not an outliner at all. <laughs> like zero. I outlined this book not at all. I'm really, uh, I like to, I know a lot of people call it discovery writing. I'm really a discovery writer. Um, I kind of tend to think of it as intuitive writing. Mm -hmm. And that would be kind of oh, the kind of writing where you have an idea. For me, characters is where the story always starts. And I have an idea of the characters and what they might be struggling with. And then the plot comes. Um, intuitively from one scene to the next. So with What Beauty There Is, 
I knew I had Jack and Ava and Maddie, and I knew I had a briefcase of money and a bad guy, and I didn't know anything else really. I would just take it from one scene to the next and then um, kind of let it happen, let, let it unfold organically as far as plotting goes. Um, I don't think that I had an outline until I had a complete full draft of the book and I was getting ready to query and then I was like I better make sure my plot works <laughs> <laughs> we sure know what's happening in this book <laughs> so at that point I took some three by five cards and I kind of worked backwards mm -hmm. and went through and kind of made sure that everything felt as if it worked kind of like dominoes when I think of plot I think a lot like dominoes as one thing kind of leading to the next uh, mm -hmm. in this kind of stack of movement and yeah, so I'm very much a discovery writer. Um, you kind of were talking about like you had these characters in your mind like that came to you first and this briefcase full of money. Um, we had another question actually from Taylor that I think kind of falls into this. Um, they've asked what inspired you to set it in winter? Like I'm really interested in when the setting came about for you. Was that all part of that initial idea or did it kind of develop through that discovery process? Well, I knew that I wanted to set the book in Idaho. That was the first thing that that my heart just told me would be really um, telling the truth for me because I knew that I really wanted it to feel as if it was coming from my life. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in Idaho. I was raised there as this outdoor girl in, in the Rocky Mountains. And so that's really dear to my heart, the atmosphere and the mood of Idaho. And then just given the fact that I wanted the story to be kind of raw and I wanted the mood to be cold and kind of unforgiving, I thought, well, winter is perfect for that. So um, it just felt like a really natural decision to make winter be a really important part of the story. I love Cormac McCarthy's The Road mm -hmm. and what he does with you know, this dystopian world of being cold and kind of forsaken feeling. I wanted to try to play with that a little bit. I also started writing the first scene of What Beauty There Is in wintertime. So I'm sure that that had an impact too, as writing the first scenes when it was like December, January, and the snow was blowing outside my window and everything just felt as if um, it were like a metaphor for the story. Mm. So, I mean, we'll talk, yeah, we'll, I mean, we'll talk <laughs> more about, like, there's some stuff that I know that is kind of going to get into spoiler territory talking about the cold, but I do think that, like, it's really interesting in the book, there is such a, um, it almost feels like another character, like, the, the winter, because it makes everything, it ramps up the tension so much more, there's, like, there's stakes that would be, um, that kind of just get higher with the idea of winter, especially when you're talking about some of the kind of experiences and themes that you're talking about in the book of like poverty that actually if you were in like a climate where it wasn't an issue for you to sleep outside for a couple of nights where it wasn't an issue for you to be home alone without the heating on like suddenly the whole story has a completely different kind of timeline to it um and so it was really I've, I found that like such an interesting kind of choice that just made complete sense and I it, it kind of um also I think you're right goes with that kind of noir style um, story. I know that like in the UK at the moment, the big kind of thriller stuff is a lot of Scandinavian, like very wintry kind of, it really feels like it fits into the the vibe as well as like the themes as well, which was really um, exciting for me. Um, I wanted to ask, like, cause you, I've, I find it really interesting that you're someone who is like, so not a planner when you're writing, because like by its nature, when you have a book like this, where you've got like characters who have secrets and like um, a certain kind of characters have different kinds of knowledge and all that kind of stuff. Did you, like, how do you decide what information to give a reader at any one time? Like, did you always know that you wanted these secrets to be revealed like the way that they were? Or was there any that you were like, oh, I wanted to hold that back for longer. Or I wanted the, you know, the audience and the characters to find out at the same time. like. Was that something that just kind of flowed when you were writing or did you have to like think about it or amend anything as you were kind of going through and editing? 
I would like to say that I am this mastermind <laughs> behind <laughs> all of the cool turns and twists or, you know, the information that comes out. But I honestly felt like that I would get to a place and I'd be like, I don't know what happens next. I have no idea what's going to happen, what information is going to come out. And I would just take a little bit of time and get a little distracted doing something else, but it would be working in the back of my mind, I think. Whenever I'd come to a spot where I wasn't sure exactly what to do next. And then it almost felt as if I was discovering it along the way, Mm -hmm. uh, along with um, the writing of the story. I would be like, oh my gosh, this would be perfect. And then it would happen. And it just, it really did feel a bit like inspiration, Mm -hmm. like little moments would happen that felt like turning points in the book. And I would just like know that they felt like the right thing. And I think that trusting that, I, I believe that that's one of the really important things that you can learn as a writer is to take time and question moves. And then when it feels right, learn to trust it and move forward. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. So discovery is really a good word because I was discovering what would happen to be like, oh, this is great. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We have a question that's coming from a Quaker witch. They um, always ask great questions every single month. And this one is no exception. Um, And this is also a question I feel like we've we've talked about before with other authors. And it's so interesting because I feel like the the, the answer is always so, so different. Um, so you've asked, where did the title of the book come from? Was that something that like you had a say in? Was it something that like you always knew? Cause I know that for some authors, they like the title stayed the same the whole time. Other times the publisher is the one who decides the title of how it's gonna go out into the world. Like what was that um, process like for you? Well, I did query it as what beauty there is. So it didn't change. And I just remember um, when I wrote the scene with Ava and she and her dad go and they're in the woods and he's trying to teach her how to hunt. That was the first time that the words kind of like just kind of happened. And I didn't know that that would be the title, but later in the story towards the end, um, that, you know, sequence, that little phrase I is repeated. And I thought, oh, this is just, this way, I, this way that I think I can capture really the um, core of the book, which mm-hmm. kind of to me is about what beauty there is in the world. And then also on its flip side, um, how that beauty is in such a kind of brutal setting, mm-hmm. how it's, how it's uh, displayed for each of us. I also had a dad who was law enforcement and who like took us up into the mountains all the time. And he would, he and my mom would kind of say, let's go see what beauty there is in the world. And so that also has a a true meaning for me because it's from my life. So there are a couple reasons. Amazing. That's a great answer. Um, (laughs) For anyone who's watching live, don't forget if you want to, um, I know some of you have said hi in the chat, hello. Um, If you have any questions, don't forget to um, put them in there and whether they're about this book or writing or like anything that you want to ask Corey, put it in the chat and I will, I've got an eye on it so I won't forget you guys. Um, Let's talk about character now. So um, uh, we had a question from Pippin on Discord who wanted to know, uh, they've said the book is primarily about Jack and is mostly in third person. What made you decide to write sections of it in first person from Ava's point of view? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like, I do think it's really interesting. You have this like you, cause you do have Jack's point of view, but then you also have these point of view from like the detective's point of view from like, mm-hmm. there's various characters who get their own little kind of sections in there. Were they always in there? Um, like as you were doing that process of writing or like was there anything that came in afterwards where you're like oh we should probably have something more from the point of view of this person or is it all very much like that process you've just talked about of like it all just came through at the right point yeah it all just kind of happened that way I think that uh, some of Doyle's point of view we ended up taking out in order to just keep 
the ratios right, not let Doyle become, you know, too, in, like take too much of the space in, in kind of the movie uh, and, and make sure that Jack and Ava were the two characters that were most focused on. And Ava, if there's any character that I feel like is most my voice and, and my words, it's Ava. And so I felt as if I should be writing her in this intimate point of view from mm -hmm. a first person place. And I knew that it was weird to go from third person to first and also from past tense into present tense. Yeah. At but I also was like, I'm gonna take some chances here and do something that might break the rules a little bit. I know the rules and so if I break them and I do it in a way that feels right, it could work. And I think it worked. I I, I think, think so as well. <laughs> I, I really worked. enjoyed that. Like I think you're you're right, like the immediacy of first person and like having it be so I think having a character who because when you write in first person, you kind of always always have a sense of like this unless it's like present tense, this character has already experienced this. And so they're writing from the point of view of having experienced it. And sometimes I feel like that can kind of be a bit weird when the character isn't like acknowledging that because of the way that the tenses work. But like, so obviously she is like, te always like teasing the reader. Like we kind of have this sense of like, she's having a conversation with you and like, she knows where this is going. And it's up to you yeah. to kind of like, like get get to the end of her story um and then you've obviously got the more like the third person stuff that gives you more of like a wider view of everything so like I really I really like that I thought it was a really cool way of doing it and like I think you're right kind of um stopped you having to like choose between third or first for everyone like it gave you a little bit of um room there and and also allowed us to really like naturally go into sort of flashback territory of like this is what used to happen because I think of all the characters her the backstory element of her is like what we need to see to understand what's going on. Whereas everyone else can kind of just have these offhand mentions about like, oh yeah, this is so-and-so we used to spend the summers with them or this is like a, this reminds me of this thing. But for her, she's so like in the past always because of like the relationships that she's like the people that she's connected to. So that made complete sense to me. I um, love that. Yeah, I really wanted Ava to, I wanted the reader wanted readers to have the sense that Ava was really talking directly to them and mm. sharing little bits of herself and that the story, yes, has concluded. And so she's telling you a story that has happened, but hopefully the present tense and the first person gives you this sense of immediacy and vulnerability from her. Mm -hmm. So I love that you that you felt that way. Yay. <laughs> it was very stressful because she kept saying things and I was like, Ava, my God. She'd be like, that was just <laughs> yeah. the first of four times I met this boy. And I'm like, and now we've got to know about these four times. Ava, please, you're stressing me out. Like only four times. I um, remember writing so that and I'd be like, oh, I put that that she met him four times. I've really got to go back and make sure that that <laughs> Make sure it's four times. Yeah, just like, what did I say this? Like she's allergic to peanuts. And now she's like eating peanut butter. Like I got to check my like... <laughs> everything I guess it's like when you're when you've got like the good thing about the inspiration mode of writing is like it, it's like coming to you like it feels really organic but then I guess you've got to go back and be like did I um discover things wrong like that <laughs> second week I was writing like did it did it all kind of go together but yeah no it was great um we also have a question from Taylor um who asks do you have a sibling or like someone that you feel as if they're your sibling and if so did you draw a lot from your relationship with them to channel into Jack and Matty I do, I have three sisters and I did uh, channel a lot of that of family and siblings uh, really are dear to my heart. And so I, I, um, I feel like that that's kind of a core part of my writing is to try to delve into that. But the relationship between Jack and Maddie probably even more than my relationship with my siblings was inspired by my relationship with my son and daughter. Mm -hmm. So the feelings that Jack has of, you know, kind of 
desperation and desire to keep Maddie with him, and the, the love that he has and kind of the bond between them is really based on my feelings for my Brady and Kate, so. That makes sense. I mean, he does have like a very parental like role, like he's kind of forced into that role, but like I can definitely see how that kind of is more of a reflection than like a traditional kind of brother, sister or two brothers kind of like equal um, kind of a yeah. amount of like you're like you're both like depending on your parents rather rather than like what happens what's happening in the book which is that he's very much like having to step up as like a kind of parental figure unfortunately um, yeah and I remember just like when I started writing the book I had just barely gotten through a divorce and I suddenly found myself in these kind of desperate circumstances where I I remember I was started writing the first scene of the book when Jack comes home um, and I had just gotten an eviction notice and I had an empty pantry and I was wondering how I was going to put food on the table for my kids. So that sense of desperation very much um, came from you know, my own circumstances at the time, the things that Jack was going through, they were really real to me at that moment. I think that it was Christmas time and the eviction notice came and I sat down and I wrote that first scene. Wow. So <laughs> I was like, I was going to ask actually, like one of my questions was going to be about like your own personal experiences and like how far you use them in your writing or like how conscious you are of yeah like taking inspiration from real life stuff and it sounds like that's like a, a was a big part of the of the writing process for for this book for me it's a huge part you know writing for me is kind of this way this book for me was very much a way to kind of make sense of my own life and things that i was grappling with with my own life so jack and his desire to take care of maddie was really coming from my life and the grief that he feels for his mom in so many ways was kind of other griefs that I was going through. And Ava's story is also really uh, dear to me, her, you know, relationship with her dad and the heart on her wrist. I share the same heart on my wrist. And so her whole story arc about thinking that she had this kind of cold black heart is, it's my story. Um, and, and Neil Gaiman says, you, you write a story to, you use lies to tell the truth. And so that very much is how I feel about writing What Beauty There Is. Um, none of it is autobiography. It's not nonfiction. It's not autobiography. But the core of what Jack and Dave are going through, their emotions, that's, that's the truth. Um, as I, in, in the very best way that I could write it, it was the truth for me. That's beautiful. So, that's so love it. But also that is something that someone, the, the idea that it isn't autobiographical is 100% something that someone who had found a briefcase full of cash would say to try and like, yeah, right. I, never, like I never found that briefcase full of cash. I don't know what you're talking about. That was totally oh. nothing about this story. <laughs> um, we had actually a question from um, Adam in the chat um, which I guess kind of links back to that stuff you were saying earlier about you kind of had written this thing like in a rush of inspiration and then you came to querying and you were like oh I gotta figure out what to do <laughs> with this I gotta make sure everything is on straight and um, so Adam has asked what was your journey like getting an agent would you have any advice for people like wanting to become writers in that process well if I made it sound like a rush of information, first, of, of inspiration, first let me say, there were little rushes of information over the course of about seven years. Wow. So I, I wrote What Beauty There Is uh, for quite a while while I was working full time and raising two kids. And I would fit the writing in like late at night or on weekends. And um, it was slow going and it definitely felt sometimes like I would never get to a place where um, the writing dream would actually come true. And so one thing I'd say for people who are like writing, if you're kind of writing and you feel sometimes low, um, I truly believe that 
with effort, no matter how fast or slow you're going, that eventually it happens. And so, you know, like for writers who are maybe feeling as if it's, it's not happening, I would just say like, keep at it because I wrote one book before What Beauty There Is and I queried it and it did not go anywhere. And I really thought oh, it's over I'm, I need to give up now. But there is this thing about your dreams that you just have to keep fighting for them. So just that first. But um, second, once I had the book drafted, I took it through about two just read throughs where not that big of changes happened like it was it was polishing kind of editing and then I got ready to query and I put my query letter together and it was a complete cold query I had no contacts in the industry and I sent out about 30 and within about two weeks I started having um, full requests and then offers of representation so it happened really quickly once um, that kind of really difficult journey of writing the manuscript was complete. And it's so different for every single writer. But for me, um, having a manuscript that felt like it really mattered to me, that felt like I had done my very best before I started querying mm -hmm. was vital. So I, if I was going to give any suggestion, it would be, you know, write something from your heart that really matters to you and do your very best to make it the best that you can. And then, um, then query. And for me, uh, with those steps in place, the querying just like it was, it just happened. And I think that it was less than a month from query to um, accepting representation. And my agent is like the most amazing person I could ask for as far as an agent. And so um, other advice, have other writers that will help you to kind of hone things and even the query, but yes, the manuscript for sure. But even the query, you know, having support and having like other writers where you're kind of a support for one another is so important. I remember I was out querying and it was only a couple of weeks, but I had no idea whether I should get any kind of response quickly or slowly. Mm -hmm. And just being able to vocalize fears and have somebody say, OK, you're fine, Corey, you're you're doing great, you know having someone through highs and lows, it matters a lot. So find your people, find your writing people. Definitely. That was a great answer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, I kind of want to take it back to you. You kind of mentioned about how long this had taken and that you'd written something before this. Um, in terms of your like journey as a writer, what has that been like? Have you, did you write a lot when you were a teenager? Did you like always want to be a writer or is it something that's come to you more recently? I did always want to be a writer. I think that I wrote my first book in seventh grade. So it was like one of those school projects where you were writing, maybe it wasn't a book, but it was, I thought of it as writing my first book. And I read voraciously. I just loved reading. And I think part of it was living in this little rural town where not a lot happened, I would devour books as a way to step outside of my world and walk in someone else's shoes for a while. And I just developed this desire to do that, to step outside my world and write something that someone else might someday read in the way that I did. And I started writing, like really writing in my 20s. So I mean, I've written for like, it's gonna give away how old I am, but like 30, 30 years I've written and, you know, gotten better slowly. Um, and I didn't ever do it like full time, full force, but it was always there, like just kind of knocking at the back of my mind, like keep at it, keep learning and growing your skill set. One thing I would say is with my first manuscript that I finished, 
um, at the time, it was my best. I really, I, I put it out there and I queried and I had, I had phone calls with agents. I had full requests. It was not a bad manuscript, but it wasn't quite right. And I remember when I realized, okay, this is not going to happen. I really looked inside myself and said, why didn't this happen? And I came to the conclusion that as much as the story might have been like cool, it was fantasy and it was like lots of twists and turns, there was something missing to it that was really from me. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like it really was. If I had one story to tell, would that be it? And so I asked myself, if you have one shot more, one more story to tell, what would it be? And then I started writing What Beauty There Is. So Amazing. Um, I have a couple more questions before we get to the spoiler section, but um, <laughs> I, I, will, I will just say again, like if anyone has any um, questions that they want to ask in the chat, go ahead. They can be um, involved spoilers or not at this point. And um, we're going to get onto the spoiler section very um, shortly, but I've got a couple, couple more <laughs> questions that are more general first. Um, so uh, something I always like to ask authors, because again, like it's one of those ones that just have such different answers is, is there like, um, either like a sort of a message or a takeaway or an emotion or like a response or something that you want or that you're hoping that readers get from the book or is it kind of a lot more open of like whatever people get from it is totally fine whatever their they kind of their responses is, is is their own response and like you don't have any kind of expectations or like hopes for that Ooh. <laughs> Oh, this is a hard question. I think there are definitely themes in the book that I hope readers will be moved by. Mm -hmm. it, it matters to me that readers might connect to Ava and her story. And um, if there was one thread through the book that probably matters the most to me that's probably it is Ava's story um but I also really wanted to make sure that I presented Ava's story in such a way that there was no moral to the story that was overt I didn't want it to feel as if the reader knew what they were supposed to get from it and um so I would not want to explain what I would hope readers get from, from what beauty there is, because I do think that once you've written the story, the reader then becomes mm -hmm. like this active participant in what they gain from it. Um, I know that's a little bit of a roundabout <laughs> answer. <laughs> I, I, know, I, know, I totally get what you mean. And like, that's, that's the interesting thing about like asking this question to authors is that some of them have like a really strong sense of like, yes, this is what, this was what this was about. This is what I want people to get from it. Other people are completely like, actually, I had nothing in mind. I don't know, just read it, see what happens. And then there are people that are like, I have a sense. I don't want to say the sense because I know that that's like, I don't want to either influence readers or like kind of, say that like this is the official thing you should have gotten from the book like because I think you're right like people as soon as you put a piece of art in the world like people will have their own responses like there will be people who really see themselves in in like every single one of a character in a book because of their own personal experiences or because of like what they're really interested in at that moment um and I think that's like one of the things that's always really interesting about going back and rereading books or like re-watching films things like that that you had a really strong connection with when you were younger is that oftentimes especially Disney like kind of stuff that's made for children you'll watch as a kid and you'll have one interpretation and you'll come back when you're older and be like oh no I 100% am the adult now like I'm like I, exactly. I'm really like I'm like Nemo's dad I'm like worried about this child I'm not like the little fish swimming around wanting to be independent anymore and I think that like that's something that's really exciting about about books is that you can read a book and have a completely different experience or like take a completely different like angle to it depending on like your own thoughts so yeah good, I know you were like well am I like dodging around the answer I'm like it was a good answer it was, <laughs> it, 
it still works. Yeah, it's kind of hard because um, I do think that the goal of the writer is to communicate something and that it moves the reader in one way or another, that yeah. it resonates. But how it resonates is it really is this two-way communication with the story and each individual reader. And so like kind of putting, inserting myself in there doesn't feel quite right. Mm -hmm. Also, I love spoiler conversation because then when a reader like says, this is what I got from it, then I can be like, oh, this is what you got. <laughs> like, here's what I was thinking. But I don't, I don't like to do that beforehand, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. That makes sense. So. Um, <laughs> speaking of, let's go on to spoiler section now. You know what? <laughs> Everyone who's currently watching, um, just, just like click pause for now if you haven't finished <laughs> I know there are some people who are like still still listening to audiobook or like still trying to finish it in time for this. Um, it's fine, just pause and then you can like <laughs> click play again once you've uh, uh, finished. Um, so, okay, let me think about what is something I'm going to ask first from this. Um, oh, this is the question that I didn't know if it was going to end up being a spoiler or like what what the significance was. But um, a Quaker witch wanted to know um, why the chapters started counting down from 30, like what the chapter numbers were about, which was hilarious because I was reading like at the same time as them. And I did not clock that. I do not know enough about Roman numerals to have clocked that. I was like, wait, they did? And it was like, yeah, they did. I was like, okay, we've got to ask that. We've got to ask about that. So yeah, what was, what was going on there? So many readers don't even notice that. So it's <laughs> that totally was good. Like, I think I've had it at a handful of times where I'm like, oh you you noticed <laughs> so i'm gonna give a, like i have an answer but it's it, it's a little bit roundabout to get there but let's let just bear with me for a minute Go for it. <laughs> so i've always been fascinated with the nature of reality and the way we experience life as this linear and finite thing when really we don't know if that's the case or not and so Ava's narrative where she's talking to the reader in the italicized sections were this opportunity for me to kind of pose the questions of our human existence and how we um, experience life as this variety of things. And so you see within Ava's narrative are all these little threads of like religion and philosophy. There's a little quantum physics thrown in there. There's chaos theory. And all of that for me was kind of food for thought, giving us little bits of just like morsels of information to ponder about um, our lives and how we experience them. And one thing in particular in the story that Ava repeats throughout her narration is Nietzsche's theory of eternal recurrence, which is this idea that rather than being finite and linear, that all of existence recurs an infinite number of times across infinite space. And so you see Eva say things like the path to truth is crooked or time itself is a circle. And those are all little phrases from Nietzsche's theory of eternal recurrence. And so at some point in the writing process, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be really cool if I could somehow visually represent Nietzsche's theory in the chapter structure. So you see um, the chapters go up like traditionally to chapter 33, where Jack reads the message from his dad on the piece of um, the book that says, go back. And that is the signaling event that begins to count the chapters back down uh, with the final chapter being the infinity sign. So I kind of thought of it as them counting into a circle that makes complete sense. Yeah, I was like, I just wasn't uh, smart enough to even notice it was happening, let alone figure out why. I was like, how did you, oh, like I'm in the middle of it, like, yeah, it makes sense now. Um, I think it's just because like when you're, especially with books like this, where like there's always like an end of chapter. I mean, all I think all books do this where like the end of a chapter is always like, don't you want to keep reading? Don't you want to know what this cliffhanger was about? And so like, I don't, I don't even notice chapter titles. I'm like, I had a look at that, the really beautiful illustration that's like in the UK, I don't know if it's in any other edition, but in the UK edition with like the knife and the wolves and like the plants and stuff. And I kind of like studied that for a really long time in the first chapter. And then I was like, 
my brain just skipped over for the rest of them. I was like, I got to get to the next bit of like the story. <laughs> I was like trying to figure out stuff. I was like, oh, where's this knife gonna come in? Where is where's all this stuff? I was like figuring it out. Um okay, one thing I need to ask because we this is like a discussion that everyone's been having having um who ended up reading it because we were like, what happened at the end? Like I need to know. I was like, everyone, everyone is like, I feel like everyone I've asked who's read it has had like a slightly different interpretation of like what is going on with Ava at the end. Like, what is it? It's like, is she dead? Is she alive? Is it is it like uh yeah like what is is that was that like a deliberately ambiguous kind of element to it or like do you as the author know like what you were kind of what was actually going on in reality there (laughs) well (laughs) so it is this way first I think that it is completely up to interpretation and I know some readers absolutely hate the open (laughs) ending and they're just like I hate you (laughs) but it felt right when I was writing it. That's all I can say. <laughs> but I, I, again, am drawing on Nietzsche's theory of eternal recurrence is this idea that our lives are not finite and that we do have this um, freedom from time that right now we can't see. And so you see all through Ava's narration, you see her kind of, she's come unstuck in time. She's freed of it. Um, And I think some of that was inspired by Billy Pilgrim with Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut, where Billy Pilgrim, he comes unstuck in time. He's not bound anymore by human limitation. And I thought, okay, I'm going to write Ava in this way as well. And so, yes, Ava is speaking to us from another place. What that place is, I I don't know. I feel as if it was kind of Ava talking to us before she begins her next revolution. You know, if you were to think of time and our existence as infinite, then yes, she's been through this one life. But I kind of think if you if you read like quantum physics, you um, may have heard of like many worlds theory, Mm. and this idea that you know, maybe there are multiple versions of us and our worlds happening and that they may be happening simultaneously or they may be happening, you know, in some other way that we just don't quite understand because we're limited by time. And I just felt like this was her story in this one circle of her life and that she's now moving on to another. So I know that's a little (laughs) weird. (laughs) but that's how that's how I envisioned it um and for me as I was coming towards the end of the book it felt like I was on this like train going down a track and Mm -hmm. I really wanted to give Ava a happy ending Mm -hmm. and at the same time it just didn't feel true to do that so um she dies and that ending is is tragic her story is a tragedy but it felt as if i needed to make that part of the ending so much of her arc is about the abuse of power that her father you know inflicts upon her and i guess i would just say the one thing i would say about the ending is like Our girls fight every day and it is so often at great cost to themselves. And this is a tragedy. And I needed to, I needed to reflect that in the end of the story. And yet I also needed to show hope and that Ava and who she is kind of like went on and, and, giving her that like next um that that her life her her being wasn't over um that her existence continued that was a way for me to do that it makes sense it's it's really like so, yeah i know i know uh i know what you mean in terms of like the that you want to if you're trying to reflect something about the world that's like harsh or real or truthful you kind of 
however much you might wish that it's something that you can just be like, and then everything was great. Everyone had a great time. Everyone was <laughs> fine at the end. Like it was all chill. Don't even worry about it. It's like not quite how that was ever going to end. Um, <gasps> and I do think as well, like that, there is like an element of hope in Jack and Matty's story. Like that kind of feels like it's that, for me at least that balance of, of being like, oh, we get that this is this doesn't end with them being separated anyway. Cause that's like, just what might happen to them it's like no no they're going to be together like this is a way that we can like they're moving forwards in a way that feels really positive and um, I kind of wonder whether you could talk about a bit about the the way in which you're talking about like poverty and that kind of stuff within the book because like we kind of mentioned it earlier but it would not there's so many things that wouldn't be an issue and so many plot points that like and decisions that are made so like Jack being like yeah I've got to go back like I need to get this money like that was that would just not have been an issue if he knew that he had some kind of support or some kind of income or some kind of like way of of uh, of supporting himself that didn't involve like having to get this money and it kind of ended up spiraling into this kind of third act tragedy and I, I wondered if you could talk about like w how you wanted to portray that or like what the how that tied into the storyline and the themes for you yes I I think that I mean, Jack and Maddie's story is so driven by the fact that they don't have options. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was important for me, I think, to try to tell that honestly. Like, um, so I did not grow up poverty stricken, but, you know, we didn't have a lot. And in rural communities, um, a lot of our young adults, a lot of our teens and children are growing up in circumstances where their options are limited when push, push comes to shove. And it was important for me in writing about small town America um, and, and where I come from to try to capture that. And, you know, there are are young people out there who they aren't worried about, you know, um, the things like that, that we so often worry about, like your boyfriend and, you know, what you're going to do for lunch on Friday, but they might actually be worried about where the next meal is coming from or where um, you're going to live in a month because something has happened with your parents. And that's just, it's just important. It was important to me to try to honestly reflect that in Jack's story. Um, I think that it drives the story, but it also felt like a way to kind of show, hey, this is what life is like for some of us. And let's walk in Jack's shoes for a little while and see what that's like and I think that hopefully there's an empathy that develops for his situation and what would you do if pushed to the limit what would you be capable of what yeah it was really like? it was really interesting because I feel like we uh, in YA often like this isn't really a topic that gets discussed at all like I think the closest that it comes is when you start getting into like speculative fiction like it becomes looking at like uh, you know dystopian stuff and like what if you and it's like well it's not it's not a what if for a lot of people like it's not a, like what if you were in the hunger games and you're in the district and you couldn't afford food and it's like well what if that happens now like in the countries that we live in like and I think that that was really um I don't know what because interesting and refreshing like those aren't the right words but it was great to see that be portrayed and like be a part of it especially with it also being within a wider story that wasn't just like um and this is a book about how sad poverty is. Welcome to the poverty porn. Like we're going to be watching, like this is what's all gonna focus on. It's like, this is a backdrop for other stuff going on that involves like family and friendship and like action elements and thrill elements and mystery and like all of this stuff bundled into one. So I really appreciated that kind of like mix of things going into it. It was really, yeah, great, great as kind of someone reading the book. Um, well, I love that you used the word backdrop because that's exactly what I thought of it as, is like the backdrop for the story. It's not the, you know, there's motive coming from it. It serves as the, you know, the the setting in a way uh, for the story, but it's not the, the plot that's driving the story. It's the motive, you know? And mm -hmm. so I just think also like for me, um, 
I wanted to write something that felt real. And I know that there are elements of this that are just way beyond that, right? You know, this is a, an exceptional situation. But Jack and Maddie's situation, like the, the, the story is an exceptional situation. But what Jack and Maddie go through, you know, the, the beginning um, chapters of the book, it's not something that is um, all that uncommon. Uh, there's like limited access to education. Uh, you know, we have a huge meth problem in, you know, the Rocky Mountains and certain areas, especially areas where um, access to education, access to jobs and access to, you know, financial assistance is limited. And for me, it, it was important to try to portray that in a way that felt like the truth. So. Amazing. Um, we're almost out of time, but I'm just going to remind the chat. If anyone has anything they've been holding on to, put it in the chat because we've got a couple more questions. I don't want to miss out on anyone's um, stuff. Um, so you mentioned before about the idea that there was like a few things with Doyle that you had kind of written, but didn't quite fit with the flow. Um, was there anything uh, else that got like cut from the final book or like stuff you didn't have space to include that you were like, oh, we really wanted to? Or was it just kind of like fits here and there to kind of balance it out? I think I went a little bit deeper into his character. I I love Doyle. Uh, Doyle is based. Oh, wow! I was like, George, just pop up, and I'd be like, "Yes, Doyle, please solve this mystery." Oh, <laughs> <us> Doyle. <laughs> so Doyle is inspired by my dad. My dad was law enforcement for Targhee National Forest, and he's just that man that goes in and tries to help people when they're in need. And so I think that I wrote the book you know, I, I went farther into Doyle's um, heart and what he was thinking and how he felt about the situation um, in drafts. And when I was in the revision phase with my editor, we were like, okay, this is young adult. We, we need to get Doyle across well, but we don't want him to take too much of the stage. And so we pulled back on some of that um, deep insight from Doyle and hopefully it's a good balance I miss a little bit of him but I think that we did a pretty good job keeping you know who he is integrally there in the story so. yeah I mean I considering how much I loved Doyle as well like he was great <laughs> I was like, it was one of those things where you're like it's which I which I think kind of like adds to the sense of like tragedy of it of like you aren't just like engrossed within these kids like and their struggle like you can see hope on the horizon like you can see this character like moving parallel to them like almost starting to cross over and it's like oh you're so close you're so close to getting this like you're getting that um I I like there's a few times within books like um when like at the book club we have a discord and we kind of discuss like the books as we're going and we um so that no one gets spoiled as we're reading, but we can still comment as we're reading. Like we put everything under spoiler tags. So you have to like click on oh. it to see it. And so we'll put like the page number so that someone could be like, oh, I'm on page hundred. Okay, I can look at all the spoilers up until page hundred that people are posting. Oh, that's and awesome. It's like really fun. And so I was like looking at the bits that we'd decided to, to messaging. Cause normally I like won't stop to, to post. I'll kind of just post my thoughts at the end. But there was this one bit, which is the bit where, um, where he goes and finds Ava's book like at the house mm -hmm. and I was like no like as soon as he's like there was a book and it had a, like a, a hot air balloon on it and I was like don't you dare look at that book <laughs> oh, you know, god's sake and it was it's like such a like it felt and like it felt very visual like it felt like I was uh, like a, a a movie like and because this does have um I think the genre is something we are quite used to seeing on film and like you when you were talking about inspiration of like Winter's Bone and like all that stuff that was very like movie heavy that it really was like I could see this moment I could like hear the music of the tension of like happening in the background I was like do you get out of there and <laughs> leave these kids alone I, <laughs> I did the goal was to write it very cinematically so that hopefully a scene a lot of times when I was writing a scene, I would I would imagine it like a, a, a scene in a movie and and try to write from that perspective. So I love that you said that. It's a great compliment to me. <laughs> so thank you. I was like, so, this is so stressful. And I was like having to, everyone was like a lot of exclamation marks as people were like reading different bits of it. They were like, <laughs> um, and like, it, I think as well, like, because you, you like set it up so clearly at the beginning with like, um, what's happening with his mom and like how immediately he makes that decision that he's like okay 
well, I'm in survival mode. Like if I, if I tell anyone about this, we're getting split up. I'm potentially never seeing my brother again. I think especially if you're talking about uh, communities in which you maybe don't have a large amount of foster carers, like by necessity, like siblings get split up. Um, and so it was like this really just like, yep. Yeah, okay. Well, I guess I'm planning ahead to make sure my brother is going to be asleep to make sure he isn't going to find out. I am going to like have construct this lie for him. And it, there's a, there's a lot of points in there where they have these conversations and Jack will like ask a question, um, Matty will ask a question and the reply will be a lie. And there'll be a pause and then Matty will ask the question again. And it's like, okay, now that I've taken a second, I'm not gonna lie to you about this. Like, and I really liked all those conversations that happen where it's like, actually, yeah, that is kind of what happens with characters who have this kind of intuition or like people in real life who have a kind of intuition where you ask if someone's okay. And they say like, yeah, I'm fine. And you're like, okay, but uh, if we're being honest, like, is that actually what's happening? And I really liked, there was like a few times in the book that that happened. And I really appreciated that kind of like, I felt like it said a lot about their relationship as brothers and like the, the strain on him as like an older brother wanting to protect his younger brother, but like also not wanting to be like another person who's lying to him and who's like not kind of seeing him as a as a person who who wants to help or like has autonomy or like needs to understand what's going on and like needs to have some kind of control. So I really like, I really love their sibling relationship and like everything that went into that as well was just, oh, just so lovely. I love it too. I adore Maddie. Uh, he's no dummy either. You know, <laughs> he's like the the little guy who everyone wants to protect, but he's smart. He is. He's so <laughs> smart. I'm like, listen, this, this boy, this little kid. How how old is he in the book? I can't remember if it gets said. Seven. In there. Seven. Yeah. So I'm so much. Um, well, I, we're, we're like basically out of time, but I just wanted to ask, like. Um, which is always a difficult question to ask authors because I feel like it's the um, Billy on the street thing of like, you run up to someone and you're like, name a human being, name a human's name. And you're like, ah, oh, oh, I've forgotten every human's name. Whenever we ask also the authors about like favorite books or books they'd recommend. But like, do you have, if people are kind of watching this stream and they're like, I've just checked out your book. Like, I'd love to like read another book that this author really likes, whether that is a kind of like, um, uh, a book you read recently or like a book that you really enjoyed when you were a teenager or just like a, a why in general that you that you've really been enjoying um what can you what can you uh recommend to people okay um well I love a lot of classics like if there's one that's just a a book that I always recommend it's speak by Laurie Hulse Anderson because it was really influential to me when I was a, a teen but recently I, I've been, so I write this really naturalistic contemporary hardcore stuff, but I love fantasy and dystopian and um, kind of sci-fi kind of speculative stuff. And I yeah. recently read The the Ones We're Meant to Find by Joan He mm -hmm. and loved that story. It's a sibling story with two sisters set in the future. And I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but I really enjoyed it. So I would recommend the ones we're meant to find. Amazing. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been so much fun. Um, and I feel like I yeah, know a lot about the book and your process. Like it's always really fun to kind of like dissect it afterwards to be like, oh, what's happening? What, what's going on when you were writing it? Um, and it sounds like you had a really like interesting process in comparison to a lot of our authors, which are quite like heavy planners or kind of a mix. Um, uh, for everyone who is watching at home, um, we are going to be back next month um, with actually the last book that we have like already announced, which is um, All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. So we're going to be talking to George next time. And we will also be announcing the next six months worth of books. There are some amazing ones coming up. I'm really, really excited about it. So uh, yeah, make sure to join us next time. And thanks again for joining us. Thanks for reading everyone and coming. Bye.